So here we are, Fiona, back for episode three of Communist Radio. Yes, we're back. You said I wouldn't be here, but... But here you are. I am. (laughs) Can't get rid of you. Next week, I won't be. Okay, all right. I'll be in Sheffield. That's a promise. (laughs) Uh, Right, fine. Today, still headline news. I know we discussed it last week, but it's Lebanon. It's Israel and Lebanon. Yeah, yeah. Because there's been an intense escalation. Um, Obviously, we had the initial attacks, which we discussed last week, and rightly called them terrorist attacks with the pages and the walkie-talkies but this has been followed by airstrikes um which have killed hundreds of people yeah innocent people yeah i saw monday they were saying 50 kids have been killed they've been hitting clinics ambulances ambulances that's right uh yeah it's 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 terror it's it's yeah mass terror um conducted by israel um netanyahu made a video speaking directly to the people of lebanon saying our fight is not with you you are being used as human shields human shields yeah that's an old word. we've heard that before this line about human shields is the is the get out of genocide get out of war get out of mass terror card for um well specific for, for israel but spe- specifically for netanyahu yeah and he is the one he's made this video he is the one driving this forward yeah all this stuff in uh, this es- escalation this yeah drive towards Basically, it's a push towards regional war on his part. That's the main thing that he's interested in, is dragging in, yeah, Iran, for example, and and others, because that's how he'll maintain himself in power. Yeah. And, you know, Israel conducts these actions, and then the only thing Western powers can say is, we urge restraint, but, you know, it's never really restraint on Israel. No, they're um, not, yeah. They, it's, it's restraint for Iran, restraint for um, Hezbollah. Like, they just... Yeah, Israel can get away with whatever it wants. Um, Yeah, and it can do that because it is a tool of Western imperialism. So they can urge restraint, but Israel knows that that doesn't really apply to it. They're going to do whatever they do. Netanyahu is going to do what he likes, safe in the knowledge that the US will back him, whatever he does, even if the US don't really like it, they will still back him. And so he's pushing this this drive towards an all-out regional war. Yeah. And all the all the things that come with it, and this is directly basically the product of Western imperialism backing for Israel. Exactly, and we have to explain it because I think people feel really overwhelmed at the moment. Um, it's just this constant. I mean, people have felt this way about you know what's happening in Gaza anyway, and and obviously the West Bank, but it's just like how how can they get away with this? Why does this keep happening? Are these just the most evil, horrific people in the world? And there's no doubt that that man is evil. That man is a sociopath. Like, I have no doubt about that in my mind. However, from a broader point of view, the way we can understand it is through understanding the logic of imperialism itself. Israeli imperialism, sure, but also Western imperialism, Mm. which for decades has meddled in that whole region, for decades has provoked division um, because it wants to maintain access to markets access to resources um access to oil access to so much stuff um and western imperialism really is the root cause yeah that's right and i saw you making this point on talk tv oh uh, that's nice. yesterday it was you were on yeah that looked like a very <laughs> calm relaxed so interview. calm very so friendly pleasant all around. Yeah. so reasonable no um yeah i went on talk tv it was a very brief it was 10 minute a 10 minute zoom call and i was um arguing debating who knows with julia bartley hewer hartley brewer <laughs> julia not that, not that it matters. hartley brewer sorry um and i mean she is vile um because you know we were talking about what's been happening and everything that she was saying was just complete defense of the of the right Mm. for for israel you know this line of the right to self-defense and one of the really revealing moments in it actually and it's in the clip that i post on social media as i say if israel's right to self-defense is based on the slaughter of tens of thousands of people terrorist attacks maintaining occupation so on and so forth then it doesn't have the right to and she's uh, israel we you know we do have the right to slaughter yeah. and then she kind of goes oh I'm the militants yeah that's that's how these people think they yeah. have the right to do anything slaughter occupy genocide maim kill injure displace they will do anything um to maintain their 
their interests, which are economic, which are political. Those two things are very, very linked. And if she comes on TV and justifies it or is an apologist for it, then she's a she's a mouthpiece for Western imperialism. Yeah, that's right, which is what you called her. And that's the main job of communists at the moment, I think, is to do what you did with her, which is to expose the hypocrisy of the whole thing. Exactly. That's the point, yeah. the double standards. Yeah of these people who will, as long as it's a, an ally of Western imperialism, they'll let them get away literally with murder or more yes. than murder, with genocide. And anyone else, it's not okay. And exposing that hypocrisy yeah. is a major job of communists at this point. One of the things she asked at the end of the interview is she says, why is it that, you know, Israel uniquely is the country that irks you so much? And Obviously, she's trying to paint me out as an anti-Semite. Obviously, yeah. she's trying to conflate anti-Zionism um with anti-semitism which is completely utterly false and it does not wash with anyone these days and i responded very very simply because israel uniquely is funded by western imperialism and we live in the west i live in britain so i want to fight british imperialism's role in supporting israel which is conducting massacres not just now in palestine but in lebanon and will go as far as is necessary um it's a very very simple answer you know why won't you protest about this because the British government is directly yeah. involved in this. And I therefore have more of a direct um, or could have more of a direct material impact in stopping it, which is what I want to do. Yeah, that's right. And talking of British imperialism, David Lammy, of course, has, oh some, has some opinions on imperialism. Yes. So today I've just seen David Lammy, our foreign secretary, speaking at the UN. And he sits there and he says... I sit here, I stand here as a black man um, and my ancestors fought um, and, you know, in great rebellions against slavery and all this kind of stuff. And he says, so I know imperialism when I see it. Russia, mm. Russia today, <laughs> Russia wants to drag the world back into a time when borders are drawn up and divided by other powers. Britain, um, the state that you're representing um, and a whole host of different things. And sure, okay, Russia is an imperialist power, but David Lammy, you are the face of Western imperialism, British imperialism, of which you form a big part of. And therefore, that is the biggest, most reactionary, most destructive imperialist power force on the planet. Yeah. And and to sit there and invoke your ancestral struggle, the 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 the, the, the black struggle, effectively, as a cover. For, for British and Western imperialism today is revolting. Yeah, that it's is disgusting. really disgusting. And it's so cynical. But that's what these people are. That's what these people are. But I don't think it'll wash. I think, of course I not. think all of these events across the Middle East are having a massive impact on consciousness. Exactly. And then you see someone like David Lammy there and it does just embed that, that disgust with the hypocrisy, uh, that sickening feeling that we have about what these people are supposed to be representing us are actually doing. Exactly. That is going to be having a big impact on consciousness. Someone replied to, I tweeted about it, someone replied saying, you know, this man is an enemy of the children of Gaza and Lebanon. I said, yeah, and Tottenham, the constituency yeah. he's supposed to represent. He's an, en <laughs> he's an enemy of the children in this country as well. Because whilst he stood there and promised billions and billions and said the UK is Ukraine's staunchest defender, aka we're going to continue funding this war, they're, they're attacking the rights and conditions of children in this country and in his own constituency. Yeah, he that's exactly me. it. Yes, well, I mean, the background to all of this conflict across the Middle East and across the world, Ukraine, Russia also, is the world economy. And this is an interesting discussion that the leadership, the executive committee of the Revolutionary Communist Party that we had just this week yeah. about the state of the world economy, because, I mean, actually, and Marxist.com has just published uh, or republished an article from the summer under the title another global recession is coming yeah i think this is quite important to understand this economic backdrop to all this imperialist conflict that's taking place exactly because right now in the media and in the last period there's been a lot about how interest rates are coming down and inflation is finally getting under control mm -hmm. They're basically trying to present this idea that, you know, we're, 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 we're getting out of this problem now. You know, we're, we're good. Every, you know, it's not as bad as it was when, you know, inflation started rocketing, you know, to these highs, food inflation, all this kind of stuff. Um, but I, I'm not feeling it. <laughs> I don't think anyone else is feeling it. Yeah. Um, they have not recovered. 
That's right. Yeah, that, I think that's the main point. It's actually the main point that this article makes. It's a very good article. It goes all the way back to 2008. And it talks about permacrisis. And it says ever since then, that organic crisis of capitalism that came to the surface in 2008 has just rolled on, taking various different forms, but it's just rolled on and in fact gotten a lot worse. Obviously, there's certain ebbs and flows, but what we're in now, the situation we're in now, is one where, sure, in, inflation has come down, but how have they done that? They've done it by by slowing the economic growth down, basically. The US, China, both of them have slowed down economically. Industry across Europe is in a very bad way. I'm thinking German industry in particular. They have bludgeoned the economy and in that way managed to get inflation down. Then they cut interest rates and the result is speculation, potentially even a so return to inflation. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so there is no, th this is not the crisis over. This is just a new stage, a new phase in the crisis. And actually there is every chance, as, the, as this article makes the point, of a new recession on the horizon. It's impossible to say exactly when, but this is the perspective from an economic point of view. Mm -hmm. The article also goes into the reverse of globalization that we've seen in the past 15 years and the the cost of uh, climate change, for example, the massive costs that are being incurred by that. And we've seen a big step up in climate disasters and so on in the last couple of years as well. So it is a really important article because, yeah, it's the backdrop to this imperialist conflict. If the world economy is in crisis, if, the, if it's shrinking or not certainly not growing as fast, then the different competing imperialist powers will fight over access to markets and resources and spheres of influence. Yeah. And that is not entirely but that is a key part of understanding it's not the total explanation but it is a key part of understanding the driving forces behind uh, imperialism yeah and the development of proxies and regional wars and different conflicts erupting in loads of different places exactly um, yeah and it's also essential to understand that economic question and the economic perspectives from the point of view of the impact on consciousness yeah. Because if people are sitting there seeing this this economic system, this capitalist system not delivering for them and actually making life worse, then you're going to see more unrest um, within countries as well as conflict between them. Absolutely. And some wings of the ruling class can see that as well. They're worried about, you know, the the unrest that is brewing and trying to... This is the problem they have is they've got politicians that are trying to contain this, but they can't really... Yeah, and that's the point. They can see it. They can see the can problem. See coming. They yeah. just can't do anything about it because it's baked in. It's inbuilt into the system, Yeah, into the capitalist system. But yeah, so that article on Marxist.com is definitely worth a read, I would say. Yeah. Now, uh, the other thing that's that's been in the news this week is the Labour Party conference oh, yeah. up in Liverpool. Have you yep. been, been following that? I have been following that. Um, I saw Youth Demand actually did a you know, oh, yeah, spray that, painted yeah. genocide conference. Shout out Youth Demand, um, which is very good. I mean, yeah, the the whole, I think what Starmer wanted going into this and the way it was kind of presented in the media is that this is the conference that proves, you know, the Labour Party are now in power. They've changed and, and all of this kind of stuff. But actually, the way it will be remembered is through one um, protest that took place throughout it. I mean, the guy who, who stood up and, and talked about ending arms sales, mm -hmm. um, whilst during that was during Rachel Reeves, her address to conference, who was strangled and manhandled and violently thrown out of the building while she did, what was it, we're in... We're party of power, not protest, yeah. uh, which they've been using again and again and again. Just this dystopian, bizarre, I don't know, it's, smugness. You can see how much the party has changed because all the conference delegates applauded as yeah. he was getting dragged out of the yeah. room. Yeah, it was disgusting. Um, that, and there was another protester, uh, or someone else also um, interrupted Starmer, actually. Um, he said, what about the children of Gaza? Yeah, I that's think. right. Um, to which Starmer replied, oh, that guy's got his conference pass from 2019. <laughs> He's obviously rehearsed that line. Which, yeah, of, nothing that Starmer says isn't rehearsed apart from something, which we'll, <laughs> we'll mention in a second. But um, what does that mean? Oh, in 2019, we cared about the children. and It was just a stupid line. But I mean, all of this is, is superficial. The point is... The Labour Party, Starmer, like they, and the government, they've got nothing substantial on offer. 
other than austerity, other than more of the same. And they're desperately trying to present themselves as something different and, and, and somehow changed. Um, and yeah. yeah, and they said, I mean, they say this is a new uh, a new party. We, we offer something different. As you say, they don't. It's just austerity. And that was also revealed during Rachel Reeve's speech when mm. the nurses yeah. voted overwhelmingly against the 5%, 5.5% pay offer that they got given by the government. Because that, and they and mo- they voted in greater numbers against that than they even did when they were taking strike action. Yeah, yeah. In the recent period, and the reason is that they've under the Tories they lost twenty five percent in real terms, yeah. and then Labour turns the Labour government turns around and says you can have five and a half percent. Of course, they're going to reject that, yeah. and rightly so. Now they made a bit of a mistake, I think, because the union said we reject it, but we're not going to ballot for strike action just yet. We'll wait and see what the government says. Yeah. But the government is not going to say you can have your 25%. Yeah. So they are going to need to fight for that and they should fight for that. And clearly there is an appetite to fight for that. Yeah. But this is the kind of thing that that Labour government is going to be facing. And at that conference, there was no, they're not going to budge. No. They, it was a, a purely pro-capitalist, pro-business yeah. event. I mean, they put on, for example, a special fringe meeting that Starmer spoke at. £3,000 a ticket it was, full of CEOs <laughs> and big businessmen. Where he and, and Jonathan Reynolds were saying, come to Britain, we want you to invest in Britain and make a profit. There you go. Come here and exploit British workers, basically. That's what they were saying. Yeah. That's the kind of party that it is. The whole thing is... I mean, if it wasn't so serious and have such a big impact on working class people it would be funny it's it's laughable the whole thing is laughable starmer is a bit of a joke yes and of course we can't not mention his uh the gaff of all gaffs demanding the safe return of the sausages <laughs> <laughs> that was my starmer yeah impression. as you as you said to we me just will. before this you said they obviously would have worked so hard to stop yeah like that, they? they would have been really trying to you know starmer's got to have his moment because do you remember last time someone poured glitter on him oh, and yeah, he's yeah. had all these it's like finally he's the prime minister serious keir comes on the stage and then he ruins it himself yeah. <laughs> it's beautiful it's yeah beautiful. um yes so that is that is very entertaining there were also one thing that wasn't mentioned at all by the media was the protests outside the Labour party conference. exactly um there was a huge protest outside the conference something like a few thousand people there maybe five thousand something like this comrades of the rcp were there and went along um and that shows the real mood in society i mean this is what this labor government is sitting on a powder keg this government has a super majority apparently it is the most shallow base of support possible um there is deep anger in society i saw something else that starmer's net approval ratings have oh, yeah, gone down that. massively mm. as well probably one of the fastest for any prime minister um and yeah and then there's a huge protest outside obviously palestine the main big issue but it's not just that it's people are are furious um you know the, the what we were talking about last week the freebies the donations mm. it's it's nauseating the 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 amount of cynicism coming out of, of the Labour government and the Labour Party um, and all of this will, will be a big thorn in the side of, of this government with the strikes and with everything else that's coming out. Sharon Graham also you know made a few statements because they tried to yeah, block the, the, the leader of Unite. Block the winter they, they had a motion on the winter fuel allowance um, you know this government is not going to have a smooth smooth journey at all yes yeah, that's right, and and the result is going to be quite a lot of radicalization because all any anyone who was hoping that maybe there'd be something different from this government is obviously going to be sorely disappointed, and they're going to look where to what alternatives. Mm-hmm. We've obviously been trying to present a little bit of an alternative. We're not very big; we can't reach millions of people, but we have been at the universities, dozens of universities, and there are far too many to list. Um, but we've been there on the campuses, at the Freshers' Fair stalls, putting on meetings, other events, rallies, things like this. And it seems to have been going down extremely well. The report that I was given just earlier today was that a, a few, several dozen new members of the RCP have already joined. Yeah. And there are... Welcome. Uh, yeah, big, big welcome to them. <laughs> Shout out. <laughs> and there are scores more, hundreds even more, who... Yeah are interested interested in joining getting starting to get involved and so on so clearly we're 
we're a little bit of a reference point for sure uh, for some of these people who are looking for something alternative but one thing that our our education de- the party's education department mentioned to me which i thought was quite interesting is that some of the kind of political feedback they've been getting from the campuses is that people are asking in a very genuine and honest way well, why why communism they agree with a lot of what we say in terms of our analysis of the world situation and a lot of what we think even historically what we say about the Russian Revolution and things like this, and also like the kind of policies we think should be pursued today, and the kind of world we're fighting for, they agree with all that. Is is the word communist? They mm-hmm. say, well, why why do you use that term? Why do you put yourselves in that in that camp? Basically, they talk about the Soviet Union, which we yeah. mentioned briefly last week. Yeah. Should we be using a different name? Should we call ourselves something different? Why isn't communist off-putting to some people? Um, which is a fair enough question. Yeah. I mean, what, how, how do you answer that kind of question when that comes up? Well, I think the first thing I'd say is that we have found, actually, that there are, I would say, thousands of people out there who do identify as communists, who use that label, term, whatever you want to call it. Um, and not all of them have an exact scientific analysis of what communist or communism means in the way that we might do. We spend a lot of time studying um, the history of, of, of revolutions, Russian revolution, so on and so forth. Um, not all of them have an exact idea, but they resonate really strongly with the idea of communism because to them, it means the complete opposite of capitalism which means an actual society where there is equality and justice and fairness and not eye-watering inequality Um, and, you know, eye-watering levels of oppression and war. Um, I think people identify and come to that word communist and communism also because it's hard. It's revolutionary. That That is where people are at. Not everyone, obviously, clearly. But there is a layer in society that we have found that actually responds really well. That's why we ran this Are You a Communist campaign, mm. um, which you've probably seen posters for or the, the residual posters that are still up there. Um, and we we met thousands of people actually probably through that campaign because people were like, yeah, I am a communist. I think I'm a communist. You know, I get that a lot, even you know, in the pub or whatever. It's just like, you know, people say, oh, what do you do? I say, well, I'm a communist. They go, oh. I think I could be a communist, you know, my boss, you know, and then it goes on like that. It's because people are really resonating with that. Um, And I think it's because it seems incredibly different to what this world is. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. People, people are driven, are being driven away from capitalism. More and more people are realizing, and how can you come to any other conclusion right now that what you're seeing, for example, in the Middle East or the crisis in the world economy or the climate crisis or whatever it is, these are not isolated things created by the mistakes of certain individuals. These are all connected. These are all part of a, a system. The capitalist system is, is to blame, a system that puts profit before everything else, human life, the climate, need, basic needs of people. And so people are being driven away from that to look for something different. And people find us on the internet, they find us on social media, they also will read about things for even in school now the way communism is taught in school is a travesty yeah but it nevertheless is presented as something totally different to capitalism it's enough to put to sow a seed and they think they're doing that to 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 push people away from communism but actually if you say to to young people living in a world that is collapsing all around them hey there, there is this system that's the complete opposite of what we do <laughs> yeah you know that people can be like, huh <laughs> let me look into that that's the point. um even a couple of years ago you remember the tory government tried to ban anti-capitalist material in schools yeah. it's like how to get people to look into that more. yeah that's the surest way to get people interested but yeah i think that's the point and and that is actually that is socialism isn't it that is communism in that its starting point, our starting point, is not just dreaming up some perfect world of rainbows and unicorns and thinking, yeah, that's that's what we want. Our starting point and Marx's starting point, Marx didn't write three volumes on what would socialism look like. He wrote three volumes analysing the capitalist system. How does it work in all of its different moving parts? How does it actually function? And what are its contradictions? And why doesn't it function in the way that it should? Why does it have certain limits? 
And from that, you realize the mo one of the, the most fundamental contradiction is the private ownership of the means of production and, and it's social and, and actual socialized production itself, but it's privately owned. And he says, the solution then to that contradiction is to socialize the ownership as well. Socialism. Yeah. It's, it's a, a logical product. This is, this is the difference between what Marx and Engels did and all previous socialist ideas. There are plenty yes. of socialist ideas around before them. Yeah. But they were what Marx and Engels referred to as utopian socialist ideas. Because they were just, wouldn't, the wouldn't mind. it? Yeah, wouldn't it be nicer if the world was like this? Yeah. What Marx and Engels did was put it on a scientific basis. That's why it was referred to as scientific. So it, it wasn't known as Marxism in Marx's day. It was known as scientific socialism. And, and that's what it's all about. And this is what's happening today as well. People are being driven away from capitalism, looking for some alternative. They haven't just had, they haven't, it hasn't just dropped from the sky, this, like, this idea that somehow, in some abstract way, the world should be better. They're seeing the problems of capitalism and they are drawing radical and even revolutionary and, yes, communist conclusions from that. Yeah. And that is the layer of people that we are trying to connect with. Yeah. Because, uh, and, and, and it's totally different, obviously, as we discussed briefly last week, to Stalinism, which is a, a top-down bureaucratic mode of uh, mm. planning an economy. Mm. And we are interested in planning economy through democratic means. It's a, it's a big difference. We probably don't have time to go into that uh, now. But that is the difference between communism and Stalinism. Maybe we can go into that at a future date. But yeah, I think this is quite important because the other thing to realize is sure of course communism is not going to appeal right now to tens of thousands of people or well certainly not to millions of people no. not to the masses of people yeah but i think it does appeal to a certain layer for sure and that's what we're aiming at isn't it that's yes the, that's the i mean main. we are you know as we say we're growing we're doing quite well but we know we're a very small organization in the grand scheme of things um in terms of what we want to achieve um, and so what's necessary for us right now is to appeal to the people, the most revolutionary people, um, drawing these radical conclusions um, and have them join and help us be the core, be the embryo of what we hope to become a future mass party. Mm. Um, and that's not just because we've sat around and thought, maybe we should do it that way. We've come to that conclusion through studying the history of um, the Bolshevik party and the history of the Russian revolution, um, which teaches us how to go from being a small party to actually taking power, which the Bolsheviks did. Um, and the, the tactics, the slogans that they used when they were a small group of a couple of hundred to a thousand compared to when they became a mass force we're different <laughs> yes that's right and we're very much still in that phase of of accumulating yeah the core as you as you put it the embryo of, of the future mass party and for that appealing to people in a bold open communist way is is necessary and it's it's sufficient for us to to recruit the next one two five thousand members of the revolutionary communist party and actually, I'm glad you mentioned the Bolsheviks there because that does take us quite neatly on to uh, the final thing to highlight this week, which is the publication of a new book. It's Lenin's writings on 1917. So yeah. it's between the two revolutions, the February Revolution 1917 and the October Revolution 1917. Which actually deals with this question of mm. how do you break out of, you know, maybe your initial force your initial core what you're used to as a, as a as a revolutionary party to actually yeah then being in the midst of a revolution um and trying to deal with that situation the complete transformation and consciousness all around you um but then different ideas getting in different forces getting in um revolutionary ideas but also reformist pressures and it's all about how you know, Lenin tries to arm the Bolsheviks and, and take them back to, you know, what was their revolutionary purpose in terms of, you know, helping lead the working class to power in, in, in Russia. Yeah, that's it. Because it's a real study. That whole year and that period between February and October is a real study also in the revolutionary process. Yeah. And how it's not just a straight line march no. to a successful proletarian revolution it's a whole there's lots of ebbs and flows and there's a lot of confusion in a situation like that lots of different pressures different class pressures 
post February, there was this euphoria. We've overthrown the Tsar. Yeah. And yet it, the workers weren't in power. It was a bourgeois government in power. So, so how do the communists connect with that? Yeah. When there's this delight at overthrowing the Tsar, but, uh, but they haven't yet got the workers in power. I mean, we actually discussed this a little bit in relation to Bangladesh today, for example, in the recent past. Yeah. There's all kinds of lessons for right now. And the main lesson is that role of a clear-sighted, well-organized revolutionary party yeah. without which you'll get nowhere and what you see in this book of lenin's writings is the role that such a party can play what you see in bangladesh today is what happens when you don't have such a party actually i actually saw dr Yunus, the kind of leader of this interim government meeting biden the other day and you know having a hug or something i thought oh gosh here we go yeah so, so that says it, it all so this is a, it's a very relevant book, I would say this one, and and it is very it's it's Lenin's writings. It's in our Leninist communist tradition, so it's a good time for it to be coming out. Hopefully, uh, the comrades can buy it and read it. It's available from Well Read Books. Yeah. So with that, I think we can draw this episode to a close. Yes. As usual, you can see the latest issue of the Communist Newspaper here, and if you haven't already subscribed, then you should subscribe. Also subscribe, obviously, to uh, to the podcast, to, to the channel. And if you are not already a member of the Revolutionary Communist Party, we are, as we've just discussed, we are trying to build that uh, layer of hardened communist cadres, as we call it, you know, mm -hmm. people who really understand the ideas and are willing to fight for them. And if that sounds like something you are willing to do, then go get in touch and we can meet up, have a chat, explain to you what we're up to, how it all works, and if it's the kind of thing you like the sound of, then you'd be very, very welcome to join one of our branches. Yes. See okay, so with that, hopefully, well, maybe we won't see you next week if you're touring. I'm in Sheffield. In Sheffield next week, okay, but we will see you see a couple you. of weeks after that then. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Bye.